Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Juror Talk for the 2021 Duma Biennial, an exhibition at the Dubuque Museum of Art through October 31st, 2021. My name is Stacey Gage Peterson. I'm the curator and registrar at the museum. Before the conversation begins, I'll give a quick overview of the biennial, then briefly introduce our juror and the artists who are joining us today. If you have any questions as we go along, please submit them using the Q&A feature. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors, Premier Bank, Humanities Iowa, and Grand River Medical Group. The 2021 Duma Biennial would not be possible without their generous support. The Duma Biennial is a juried exhibition open to artists in our region who are currently creating new work. It's an opportunity for the museum to bring in a juror who has a finger on the pulse of contemporary art in America and is an expert in his or her field. This allows us to experience contemporary art of this region through the juror's expert eyes. This year, our juror is Laura Burkhalter, curatorial manager at the Des Moines Art Center, where she has been part of the curatorial team since 1999. I'm very pleased to welcome Laura here today. And she is joined by a wonderful group of the biennial artists, including, and I hope I don't miss anyone here, Ange Altenhofen, Jill Birschbach, Tibby Kelcha, Stina Hensley, Louise Camus, Linda Callen, Elizabeth Rhodes Reed, Vera Sekic and Katie Shuddy. Welcome everyone. I look forward to the conversation. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Laura. Hi, can, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I am Laura Burkhalter. Um, as, as Stacy said, I have been um, working in the curatorial field in one way or the other since 1999, um, working at the Des Moines Arts Center and our focus is international contemporary art. Um, our collection does go back to the 19th century. So I have some, some research qualifications for the 19th and 20th century, um, but uh, international contemporary art and art, art made you know, within the last, um, roughly within the post-war era, but really usually within the last 10 to 20 years is, is what I work with most of the time. Um, I also can proudly say that my first assignment when I walked into the Des Moines Arts Center as a very young 24 year old, I'm sure I didn't feel young then, but um, it was to work on the Iowa Artist 1999 exhibition, which was still slide submissions um, in that era. So I have worked on the Iowa Artist exhibition or worked you know, as part of the team doing it at least 20 times in my time at the Art Center and I am an Iowan as well. So um, I, I'm really thrilled to have been asked to work on the Duma Biennial because I feel like it, it combines um, my, my passion for contemporary art, but my real um, love for working with the artists who are my neighbors, who are my friends, who are part of the community that, that I live in in the neighboring states and communities. I think that there are um, unique challenges to being a Midwestern artist, but I think there are unique advantages too. And I love having that conversation with artists. I love showing off the good work that's done by artists um, in Iowa and in the Midwest. Um, so this was very fun for me and I, I really just enjoyed the opportunity. Um, not just seeing new work by artists whose work I was familiar with, but being introduced to so many new I say new faces, but really new artworks. That's, I probably have a better uh, memory for artworks at this point in my life than I do for faces. But um, that's always a great thing to see, you know, to see these, oh my gosh, I haven't seen this before. I don't know this person, or I do know this name, but they're making some new amazing body of work. Um, I absolutely loved that part of this experience. Um, the most frequent question I think I've gotten from people, whether it was at the opening or um, talking through things with Stacy and her staff is what my process was curatorially. Um, what I did, and this is going to sound like a generalization, but it's, it is what I did was I just looked <laughs> through the submissions over and over and over again until um, an exhibition it started to form in my mind. Um, I definitely think in terms of exhibitions. Um, 
as opposed to sort of more, uh, I think obviously I'm looking at the individual works of art and going over those and going back to them and, and tagging the ones that I'm interested in. But really, I do think that group shows like this serve an institution and serve the artist so much better if there is, um, there are some connecting threads and connecting themes. I think that one of my jobs as a curator is to make art look as good it po as it possibly can. And while that certainly includes sort of formal elements like lighting and wall color and placement, I think that the work that you surround another work of art with can really make an artwork sing and can show you things about that work of art. Um, that's also the reason why most of you, I, I think are represented by more works, more, more than one work of art um, in the show is I like an artist to be able to, to present themselves to an audience. And I think that's especially important in um, a place where you're, the audience are your neighbors and your, your immediate colleagues. Um, so those are some of sort of the, my curatorial philosophies and practices. Um, I think I looked through the submissions as a whole three or four times and then narrowed them down and looked at that three or four times and just kept narrowing and narrowing. So some of your works, I you know probably looked at a dozen times before I got to my final idea for that exhibition. Um, when I say I was looking for an exhibition, I think what I, what I mean is I was looking for common themes, common techniques, common aesthetics, common ideas. Um, those aren't hard and fast concepts, but I certainly was happy to see that there were clearly people um, thinking, I think, about similar things, or maybe I was seeing similar things because of um, the times and the, the climate that we're all um, going through. I think that a show like this needs to be about um, the moment that we're in, and we are certainly in a unique moment, and I think most of you probably created a lot of this work in a, in a unique moment in your careers and lives, although, you know, maybe you made it before, but it, things look different within the context of the times we live in. Um, so I, I was absolutely aware of, of the fact that I was doing this online because I, you know, couldn't leave my house in certain times that this was all coming together. And I thought about all of you making work in, in a much more isolated environment that maybe you, you had from before or, um, you know, how this even comes together without, you know, me being able to go and physically see the space. Um, again, I, I realized that that those factors didn't come into play when all of this work was created. Um, but we all saw the work, I saw the work and even as it exists now, um, within the moment that we're all in. So those were, were sort of some of the things um, I was thinking. Um, I, I'm absolutely thrilled with the way the show looks in person. I'm thrilled that I got to see the show in person and got to meet so many of you. Um, but Im images are hard to work from. Um, I think you all know because you all make a wide variety of works that some works photograph really well and some works don't, no matter what you do or sort of who you hire to take those pictures that, that there's always something lost um, when you're not physically in front of a work and you can't see that that uh, three dimensionality of the texture of it, the color, the light. But I very, very confidently say that every single work in this show looked better in person than it did in, in the submissions that I saw. And that's what I wanted when I walked into that gallery. Um, so um, I, you know, thank you all for submitting. Thank you all for um, presenting your work digitally in the best way you could. I know that that is a huge challenge um, for artists. Um, and I, I have some questions for all of you. I want you guys to, to have a voice in this. Um, I'm not ever somebody who likes to just talk and talk and not have feedback. And we have all of you here. So, um, I've come up with some sort of just general, I think, topics that you, all of you certainly don't have to answer all of these, but I think I'm hoping that some of these topics will inspire you to, to talk and maybe ask questions of each other. I know that artists don't all get together, I think as much as we all would like to um, and have those conversations about what, what we do. Um, so I'm hoping that this is a great kind of uh, round table experience. Um, but before that, I do, because this is a juror's talk, um, do any of you artists have specific questions for me? 
And I will oh. jump in real quick and just acknowledge that Dan O'Brien, Daniel O'Brien joined us too. So he's here as well. So Thank ask you. your questions. If you don't have them right now, we can we can we can think about it and ask later. Um, but I can only see a few of you, so I can't see if somebody's like raising their hand or. Yeah. Um, can so, you hear us though? Yeah, I can hear you. Ah, okay. I think you did a real bang up job. I was Thank impressed you. with the show. I mean, I had I always wondered about how difficult it would be to try and jury a show just from slides. I always wonder about that. But I was impressed. Um, that is a strong show. That little museum really does put together a real strong show. I'm impressed with what I'm seeing out of this place. So thank you. You've done a good job. And Stacy was so helpful in explaining the space to me, talking to me about how the, the you know the walls work together and and the proximity understanding you know how close works of art were going to be to one another um she was really instrumental in making sure that you know the order of the things on the wall was correct it's her space that she works with um and that you know it is a it is a very intimate space um and a lot of you make I, i'm attracted to work that takes up a lot of psychic space as well as physical space um and i think a lot of you th that shows in my selections and so um i really I'm, I'm happy that everything is playing well together in the space when I actually got to walk into the gallery. Um, I, that kind of leads to the first topic that I would like, um, I think, and I think people will be curious about is that um, one of, I used to teach the, the docent, I used to head up the docent art history lectures for the docents at the Des Moines Art Center. And we always talk a lot about materials and there's a quote that actually comes from a muse museum education um, book, but it's not everything is art, but everything is art materials. And we start a whole series of lectures on that quote. And I, I, I love that we live in a time where everything is art materials, but I think that that means that artists, you know, if you can choose anything, what you choose then is very deliberate, that it's very, probably your materials, you maybe went through you know, various phases um, to get to the materials that you love because you have so many options. Um, so does anyone sort of want to talk about their relationship with, with the media that they use and how it informs their, their work overall? I, <clears throat> I guess I, I wouldn't mind talking about that. I, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, and and um, I think yeah, and it's a it's a really important question. I mean, I think for the the work that I've been doing, material is 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 key, um, and the stories that the materials have um, themselves, I, I think, is 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 uh, for me, it's really important. Um, so the two pieces that you selected of of my work in the show um, are uh, there they <laughs> there they are. Um, I was thinking about what I would say today, you know, and and to talk about these works in a very concise way, and um, the the their, their fur, um, which I, I have struggled with <laughs> dealing with um, for decades. Um, when I was working in a costume shop, um, I have a history as a, a costume builder and designer in Chicago, um, and one of the costume shops I worked in, um, we were. Um, I was asked to go through our the fur collection and to weed out everything that was starting to rot and and get eaten away by various um, bugs <laughs> and which was kind of a horrifying experience for me and I just I you know during the entire process I just I just wept I you know thinking about the, the animals and and I and then I took all the rotted and rotting fur um, garments home with me with the intention of either burning them or burying them. So I had these garbage bags full of rotting furs and coats and and stuff. And and I ended up saving a few pieces that um, just were um, particularly interesting, I guess, to me and kind of symbolic and and spoke to me about the the animals that they you know they came from or had been. Um, so the piece on the left um, is called Hush, 
I remember how warm your skin used to be. And um, on the fingertips are, um, it's beaded with um, little beads that represent braille dots. Um, so each fingertip has a word on it. So um, that piece came about as um, uh, last summer, I guess, when I was, and like the rest of us, we we're all really struggling with, um, you know, distancing and, and isolation and not being able to touch. And tactility and touch is a really important aspect of my work. Um, and and it, it has to do with um, a, a diagnosis um, that I received right out of grad school that I could, um, I had a degenerative eye condition um, where I could go blind. So I started studying Braille and and thinking about my my art as, as a tactile experience in addition to just a visual one. So um, it, so the the mittens, yeah, were uh, kind of referenced both the the animal, a rabbit <laughs> that they came from, and the person who wore these gloves. These are the linings of, of gloves that have been turned inside out. Um, but also that um, yeah, our, our connection to other people and, and just how stricken everybody has been with you know, loss and, and, and isolation over the past year. I mean, things are obviously getting better now um, and we can you know, go to restaurants and hug our friends, but that idea that we could actually kill somebody that we loved because we, we kissed them or touched them or hugged them or shook their hand um, or held their hand is, was just really um, kind of a, a, I think a, a tragic experience worldwide, you know? So um, I know I have gotten off <laughs> the subject of material, but, um, but yeah, so I, the stories uh, that um, I start with, you know, are um, come from the materials that I, I work with. So Thank you. Thank you. That's, I mean, I, that, I, that's, I think uh, people, you know, artists are mister, mysterious to a lot of people, even people that maybe go to galleries a lot, you know, what, what, what artists do and, and how they get to what they make is, and when you can have just a really straightforward story, like I, I was working in this shop and I found these things. And I mean, I feel like that's, that is what that sort of behind the scenes stuff that we think is maybe more you know we don't think maybe that's as interesting but I do think that that how artists get from A to B is a super um important thing to talk about because it, yeah. it takes away from that sort of Van Gogh mythology that a lightning bolt of creativity comes down from the sky and then you sit down and make a beautiful object and that, right, that, right right I, I, I don't want people to think that's how art is made and I do think that talking about um you know, what, why, or even if you paint, even if you do choose something really traditional, I know that that can be a difficult decision for um, artists. So I, I love to, to hear, does anybody else want to talk about their materials and how they got there? Yes, I'll, I'll talk about it. Um, because I've always seen art from, everything is art to me, from the smallest thing. My studio is full of just things that I have collected um, object, object items. Um, people bring me their <laughs> leftovers. I mean, it can be cardboard. Um, I have a huge collection of firework shells that didn't explode correctly. Um, animal bones. And you, if you surround yourself with this stuff in the studio, you know, maybe you're not using it right then, but all of a sudden you're working through a piece and it just comes to you. Um, the pieces that I have in the show, though, are more, this is just fiber rush, but um, as artists, we all try different things. We all use different materials, and these were nesting, um, which I think a lot of us did. We've been doing for like a year and a half, and it's a protective thing. Um, a lot of my pieces are very secretive, kind of you know, what's in there, what could hide in there, you know, where can you hide? Um, but I just, I think art is everywhere. It's just, and I think artists have a, have a unique view of how they, what they look at and how you interpret um, what, what is there. Um, Cedar Rapids last year went through a terrible derecho 
and we lost a lot of trees and a lot of damage. But this spring, the beauty of what's come back has changed, changed the landscape. You know, these terrible trees that had no leaves and the tops were all broken off, they've all filled out into very interesting, odd shapes, but they're green and they're gorgeous. Um, out in my yard, I'm finding marigolds that I never planted. I found a tomato plant in the crack of the driveway. I mean, things are just, it's, but it's just things that we see in how we use them. And, and we have a real connection with our materials. Anyone else want to take that one on before we move to the next one? Um, I could talk a little bit about my. Hi, hi Tibby. Hi, how are you? Um, so, yeah, my materials are a little bit unusual. Um, so, you know, my piece is in the show. And thank you for selecting them. They're really small, you know, contrary to your philosophy. Um, so, they're circuit boards and uh, yarn, cotton yarn, pretty much embroidery on circuit boards with some uh, electronic components thrown in. So these are lots of references to all sorts of things that I happen to know, I happen to leave and put together. Um, I mean, you know, there are lots of historical connections between the textile industry and the electronics industry. The electronics industry copied a lot from the textile industry um the you know like punch cards and uh, things like that the way to route wires on circuit boards but for me these also have a very personal um dimension it's not just reference to history um you know i'm from romania originally and uh, well knowing how to do circuit boards and electronics kind of brought me to us so that's the reason why i'm here and i started making art after i came to us so in a way these are um, kind of celebrating the fact that i can make art here you know i don't know if i would have started making art in romania i have no clue probably not but who knows um and then you know like the what you see uh, in the images are uh, these textile patterns from, um, you know, like really old textile patterns from various books um, that I found about 100, 110 year old books uh, collected from throughout Romania. The, there are these traditional garments. Um, and growing up, I had grandparents in some remote, in a remote village in the mountains, and I would spend the summers there. And I would, I still remember seeing people wearing this kind of traditional garments. It was a very traditional place. So for me, combining these things that are very new, electronic stuff that everyone has in their pockets, I'm turning them into objects of art, something that's very common. So for me, that's something very interesting. Um, I'm combining also this very new technologies with some very old technologies like embroidery. And yeah, so for me, I was kind of thinking of all these things. I started making this during the pandemic and uh, it was kind of a period of reflection of, you know, how did I end up here, you know, in this place at this time and, you know. Did I was you, all did you know how to embroider or did you teach yourself when you started? Uh, I, I taught myself. How to how to do it? Um, yeah, the the first one that I've done, I'm not very proud of it, but I've learned. <laughs> I've learned. <laughs> I, I I mean I I asked that there's there's two people there's at least two embroiderers in the exhibition, okay. and I you know I think a lot of us probably one of our first you know learning you know cross stitch is something that a lot of people do for the first time when you're sort of older elementary age or young, you know, it's something that a lot of us are taught by a mother or a grandmother or aunt or something like that. And, you know, some of us stick with it and some of us don't, but it is a, <laughs> it is a, a it's a kind of embroidery that a lot of people maybe have had some experience with and have some sort of personal reference with. I, I do it as a hobby, um, oh, okay. but I, I love that it, like I said, it, it was very unexpected. This work 
was very surprising to me, this combination and also, you know, the, the tradition of the patterns. And I, that type of juxtaposition, I think shows up actually in a lot of work in the exhibition where you have something that is traditional or craft-based mixed with something that's more abstract or having to do with contemporary life. And so obviously I have a, I have a affection for that, that juxtaposition. Um, mm -hmm. And these were, and again, I, I liked the very small scale um, right. of these works. I think that sometimes uh, going small is, is, is a more power, is a very powerful choice because it has to, it draws people in. Um, so, so thank you for submitting those. Right. Um, is that Louise, are you, is this your work? Okay. Nope. Or, sorry. I think I'm just showing. Do you have your uh, hand up, Louise? Do you have, do you have I, I do. I okay. do have my hand up, yeah. but that's not my work. I think that she's just okay. showing <laughs> Tibby's work on the corner there. Okay. So my work is the large um, or the tall installation um, in the set in the center of the gallery. I don't see anything that's not beautiful. Um, is the title, and the material is um, silk organza. And the choice of material was uh, very important to me that it's just the tactility and the translucency. I made a, I submitted, you know, for the jury, a prototype that was just made out of like polyester. And, you know, while it did some of the same trans, translucency, um, it didn't have just the, you know, just the beautiful organic um, sensibility of the, of the silk organza and all that 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 particular material and being used um, for all kinds of traditional gowns and undergarments uh, would bring with it. Um, and so the work is about the diminishment of that is caused by dementia when you stand in front or in back, how the images of the sticks um, disappear. And so there is a juxtaposition that they're you know, mechanically uh, photographed and screen printed um, on the fabric, um, but they're about a woman who was like collecting um, sticks as part and putting them on the side of a driveway as part of her just sort of like daily um, keeping her mind still um, with initial stages um, of dementia. But the title of it is Veils. And I think our lives have all been veiled um, in similar ways uh, this year, certainly not to the level of um, dementia, but I think it, it does always it does also speak to contemporary uh, this year. Does anyone else want to talk about the materials? Yeah, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. yes, yes. Can you hear? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Um, I needed something because of the virus because of we had to learn a new way of being you can't get close to somebody you had to wash your hands you have to spray alcohol in the car you don't want to be in a crowded space there's like all these new habits we had to do the isolation didn't bother me you know the solitude is fabulous <laughs> but i wound up finding myself standing in the window just staring i could stand there for like 40 minutes i needed something to focus on so the wood blocks and the metal work are the two things that I can do that forces concentration. I'm dealing with very, very sharp little knives that if I cut myself, I'm not even going to feel it. And that I just noticed I've cut myself because there's blood there. And the metal work you have to pay very close attention to because if you're not, you can pound right through it. Or you can hit your finger. There's a lot of weird little things that can happen that way. And these are the two materials that I decided that would keep me focused. And that's what I did. That's all I did. And once I was able to start with the wood and once I started with the metal, it calmed me down. I use the materials for when I need the materials. Painting is something entirely different. It's a different kind of beast. When I paint, I'm actually relaxed. It's the type of thing that, it, you're entering a different kind of world than the wood blocks or the metal. The metal is a little freer. The wood blocks, that one, um, little head, that one I sort of began to draw, but I was so frustrated and it was so bizarre. And I had some family stuff going on that I caught myself doodling with the pencil when I'm on the phone. Everybody does it, little circles, little squares, coloring in little squares. 
all that kind of stuff, I thought, well, let's just sharpen the knives and see what happens. So that wood block is very different than a lot of the other wood blocks that I do. Um, the same thing sort of with the swamp because the longer it went on, if I had to listen to any kind of news, any more bad information that came, there wound up being another fish. That, that swamp got populated much more than I sort of expected it to be. I think I kept cutting until there wasn't any more space to cut. Um, but those two things were, it was, um, they surprised me. There, I've got blocks that are that size. I need bigger blocks now, I think. But these are the pieces that calmed me down. And that's how I choose something. I do wood because of one thing. I do the metal because of something else. And painting, yes, I draw. Lately, I've been doing a lot of drawing. Um, and I'm surprising myself by what I get because it's a little rela more relaxed now. It's more colorful. Well. Everything is sort of relaxing a little bit. Yeah, we got virus. It's not done with us yet, but at least we can see our friends. At least we can go out a little bit. You still have to wash your hands and do the alcohol. That's something that we've all learned how to do. It's, it's all sort of strangely creepy, but I'm glad I can do the artwork. I'm glad I'm not afraid of trying something. I'm pretty much fearless. Um, it's a good thing I don't have a forge. I don't think anybody would ever see me then. But that's it. The materials are important to all of us. And I think we wind up choosing it because of what's inside. I don't think there really is a uh, good explanation for why we're messing around with one thing or another. I frankly love it. I like the surprise. And that you hit on a couple things that I definitely heard from, from some people, from artists that I spoke to is that Although uh, that, that during the time of when we were more isolated during the COVID year that they suddenly found themselves with more studio time than they had because those things that pull you away from your studio time suddenly maybe weren't there as, as much. Um, or, and I, I know I suddenly had more, I had an exhibition that was canceled. And so I had this extra time to do those sort of research projects that I had kept pushing back because I had all these other things pulling me away. Um, did any of you feel like you, and I, you know, obviously then that leads to, I think, experimentation or working on something that was maybe more labor intensive that, than the type of work you've done in the past. Did anybody else have um, sort of feel like that they, the silver, I guess the silver lining of, of being um, closed away led to some breakthroughs or led to some new creative time. TB touched on that a little bit too with um, taking up the embroidery. Oh yeah, yeah, that's absolute. That's, I think everybody <laughs> experienced that whether you knew it or not. Yes, I, I, I know I did. I had to catch myself, I had to make myself get started because it was like having your brain be constipated. And then it's okay, but yeah, the, the time was good and you could focus and you, there were no interruptions. But I don't have a whole lot of interruptions anyway. And I'm pretty stubborn and bullheaded about sticking to my guns when it comes time to doing something. So yeah, it was interesting. I'm glad it's sort of behind us though. Well, I can, oh, Sina. Oh, um, no, I was gonna chime in with, I think the added sort of, you know, solitariness, but I, in my situation, I kind of moved here you know, right in the middle of the pandemic. So I kind of got, I don't know if it's not lucky, but um, uh, I had so much more space too, which I had more space and more time and no social network. So it really, it gave me the opportunity to explore stuff I hadn't thought about and just going back to materials, like really explore the juxtaposition between, you know, like collage, like soft materials and hard materials and building tension between those types of things. Um, yeah, which I think really pushed me. So the added, yeah, time really, yeah, as Linda was saying, kind of got me to explore more. I'd been kind of just doing ink and watercolor for so long and I don't know, it was, it was yeah, it was good. It was hard, but it was also great creative, creativity wise. One, one of my other things, sort of uh, talking points that I have is nature. 
Um, I think that along with being inside more, I think a lot of us found, you know, the only thing we could do that felt safe to a certain degree was go outside or start a garden or, you know, take a walk in the park or obsess over our pets or, you know, whatever that happened to be. And there is a lot of, I think, nature materials, nature imagery in this exhibition a lot more than I think. And, and again, it, even in the submissions overall, it felt like there were um, so many works that were focused on, you know, whether that means your backyard or your or the walk a walk in the park or a, a for that there there definitely was a, seemed a very large amount of of nature materials nature imagery and I you know I, I definitely started to look for that um, when I was putting the exhibition together um, and you know I think again because it's all about context when I was selecting the show I was thinking about oh it's because you know outside is is safe but. Now I think we, I'm thinking about it. Well, is is it because we see nature as out of control too? I mean, we have um, a virus <laughs> that is all over, and I think you know the news is all forest fires, and the derecho is a thing that uh, impacted especially eastern Iowa more. Um, is that I, I think I initially was thinking about nature as maybe a comfort or an inspiration, but I think it can be a little darker than that too. Um, does anyone have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I do. I think you, I think that's absolutely correct. Um, um, I, nature can be, um, very healing, um, and it can also be terrifying. And I, but I think what, what, as a result, like from what you were saying and, and because of the, the pandemic and stuff and, and climate change and everything else, it's, it's forcing us to reckon with nature and our relationship to it in all ways um which you know a um yeah and yeah we can't um hide from it anymore we can't walk away from it anymore we can't um abuse it anymore um so uh yeah yeah i think yeah and I think some of the work that um, combines technology and nature is particularly interesting to me, you know, um, that, that, you know, we have to find a balance between those two things, you know, moving ahead with um, medicine and, and technology that will help us live healthier lives um, and uh, still, you know, taking care of our environment and our planet and, and the other creatures that live here with us and plants and neighbors. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think I, in a way, I think that the pandemic has been um, good for us. You know, we were, you, uh, somebody mentioned the silver lining to the, the, the pandemic. And I think is, is that, that we can't, that we're a global community, you know. Um, I was one of those people that, that actually had to keep working outside of my house during the pandemic. I'm a, a librarian. Um, so, uh, it was, it was, yeah, stressful. It was, it was a very stressful period. Um, and, uh, I was quarantined three times. <laughs> um, so yeah, which I, I, that story is not unusual. I think there's, you know, many, many, many people that really struggled with, you know, in, in all different ways. So I think it, yeah. It's, it's forced us to really come together, you know, as I, mean, a I, I, agree. I agree. We all talk about our, you know, I, I was able to work from home, but my partner was not. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I was not ever as worried for myself as I was for him. And then, you know, that, that you, you know, everybody's circumstances is different and everyone's family connections are different and everyone's perceived. There, there's so many, I, I think that we all really saw ourselves relative to others in a different way. Um, and especially, you know, working in, I, you know, I work, I'm not an artist, but I work in a museum and the museum, you know, even thinking about, you know, when, when the museum closed and reopened, did I think I even thought about, well, what is the place of art in all of this? What is the place of, of people not just making art, but experiencing art? Um, and I definitely had my own little existential crisis about is what I do, and, you know, important and, and is the place where I work, you know, I, and I was, when we did reopen, it was 
wonderful to see people come back and say, I'm, even if they just said, I'm just so happy to not be in my house anymore. And in another, you know, a place that's calming or a place where you're looking at something different. Um, it, it felt good, but I do, I, I think the shift in thinking and in creativity, I feel like the art, you know, I, you got a lot of this art was actually made either, you know, during the early stages of COVID or right before. I'm very curious to see what you all will make next and what the art world at large, you know, will sort of how we'll grapple with all of this. I think there's some really, you know, interesting work that's going to come, come about it. And I mean, even something like the derecho, it kind of, I, I kind of, I had to explain to someone what, what, it, what it was and what happened, someone who isn't a Midwesterner. Um, and I just, you know, there was so much chaos going on and then that this extra chaos happened. And then, you know, the idea that that could happen again, it is something that I, I don't feel like I maybe process as much as I should because it wasn't quite as bad here. Um, but in my subsequent trips to Eastern Iowa, really being confronted with, with the devastation um, that those of you who live, live farther East than I do, um, I, I haven't fully considered that, but I do think it is again something we're going to see more impact from. Um, oh, well, I, I, saw mean, some, I have a quick, I, I have a quick uh, um, comment to make to kind of circle back to this whole notion of time, and we're talking about you know structure versus chaos and uh, having schedules and things. I personally, um, I had a really tough time with all the extra time that I had, you know because that was one thing that for so many years, you know, I had had children, I had other responsibilities and studio time was something I always had to kind of, you know, wedge into my day, right? There had to be a very specific time in which I did this. And it was such precious time. And I remember I would open the door and be like, okay, I've got two and a half hours. I've got to be productive. And my brain was like on, you know, instantaneously. And when this pandemic hit and all of a sudden everything, and my kids are grown you know, and everything just sort of, I don't know what, it's just like it evaporated, right? You know, our schedules did. And like you said, there's so much uncertainty. There's chaos from the weather. There's, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff going on in DC. There are, there's civil, you know, there are protests, like everything's happening all at once. And I just felt like my whole, and, and I'm, you know, a creature of habit. So it's like everything became upended. Know, suddenly all at once and for me I guess um, you know it was just such a struggle to find a way to uh, make sense of my day and to find you know those those opportunities in which to work and it's almost like it became a lifeline you know to carve out that that time in which to work and I saw it happening in my work too where like the work became a little more orderly it became a little more structured you know, it started to respond to the fact that, you know, there's all this stuff going on, obviously, and there's so much fragility and, you know, ultimately entropy is taking us all down. But yet, you know, I feel like I need to resist, you know, so it was, it was a matter of just kind of keeping everything um, balanced, but feeling like at any minute, it's all going to like, you know, tumble down, fall apart. So I think, you know, the work sort of started to, um, uh, exist on that precipice or, you know, sort of that, that little like fall from between, you know, the, the, the chaos and, and the order. And like I said, it's, it was really kind of, it was, it was an essential lifeline to, to have that, that opportunity. So yeah, to me, like having all that time, I think precipitated in some ways an existential crisis. I mean, that's actually a really good segue to the last point I wanted to ask you all about, which is um, labor and work. Um, I think another thing that that audiences maybe don't understand that art is work, it's labor. Um, whether you get paid for it or not, it you should be. <laughs> and it is, um, it is, I think, especially hard for uh, parents and women and caregivers to, you know, if you aren't an artist, well, whether you're an artist full time or not, many of you have have other jobs that may be art related and may not be. Um, but I, in, especially in the Midwest, I think sometimes um, our community who aren't part of the arts community um, don't quite understand the level of labor um, that art takes. Um, and this is a show that's mostly women. Um, and I do, you know, I, I have watched my, my, the artists that I know, you know, really struggle with how do I be an artist when I also have a job and I have kids and I have a family, um, or even if 
how do I make art my full-time job when I have kids and a family? Um, do any of you wanna, wanna talk about that a little bit? Nobody, usually this is a hot topic. <laughs> uh, um, but I, I, I do, like I said, I think it goes a little bit with the sort of, you know, what do artists do all day mystery that I think a lot of people have. Um, but if, if, if nobody I, wants to get into that. I, mean, I guess I can, I'll respond if I can, if you can hear me. Yes. Yep. Sorry. Um, you know, it, my, my paintings have uh, started to use neon tape in the last couple of years. And I think the pink was actually a direct, uh, an affront to concepts of work. Um, I think our, I think our understandings of work and how we engage with our world, we see nature as the enemy. Um, these are the reasons we have pandemics. And, and so pink is to remind us that, you know, utility is not our only function in life. And um, I think that uh, I actually have started just this year to try to remove the word works of art from my vocabulary because it, it, it basically, it tries to balance a scale that was made by people who are destroying the planet. And, um, and, and I'm not really an activist, I'm just kind of trying to frame the argument, but um, I think that, uh, and I'm just sort of grappling with how I'm able to understand these. I think that, um, Laura, you made a, re a really insightful statement about these being behind some of us um, in months uh, where we are starting to maybe even understand them ourselves. And, and um, I think that uh, <clears throat> in me trying to remove the word works of art, it, it, it's a real difficult thing. I'm finding that, you know, pieces of art just doesn't seem to really, you know, uh, you know take the place of that. So, um, because it, I think in some ways it's telling people, well, hey, I'm working too, you know? And I think that, um, that when they look at art, they want to feel that, that you've worked too, you know, that you've suffered or struggled, you know, that, you, that you've been able to um, do um, things that uh, are allowing you to put these things together. And, but it's hard for them to look at the pink and think that, you know, you can have um, a bit of happiness in your life while you, while you do things. That color can be an explosive experience. Um, the Amish, uh, Amish are, are known for a more, more of a conservative lifestyle. And yet, if you look at the Amish quilts, they just, they just abound with, with, with risky color. And I think that um, it, it maybe these are ways even for them to, um, uh, uh, to sort of let parts of themselves out that, that are, are kept under wraps. And I think the pandemic told me the wraps come off because I'm tired of listening to to the people who are telling us, uh, you know, that works of uh, art have to have function. See, I said it again. It's it's ingrained in our speech. So, so thanks, Lord. Um, I, I'm and, glad you I'm glad you brought up the color pink. Um, somebody, I, I mean, I kind of noticed, but actually, somebody mentioned to me at the opening that there was a lot of pink in this exhibition. Um, <laughs> and I I mean, I'm gonna I'll say it's personally because I like the color pink, but I I do agree that pink. Pink is one of those colors that it's hard to be ambivalent about. Um, I think that pink is is often a statement, especially hot pink. But even I think you know, I think I, I certainly know I've had conversations with with gay artists or with women artists who are almost afraid to use the color pink because they think that there'll be some sort of judgment made about the seriousness of their work, or or vice or the opposite of that. People that embrace the color pink because they feel it makes a statement. Um, and some people, you know, are afraid of prettiness in their work, which I don't think anybody should ever be. Um, but I, I, I do, I do am drawn to pink because I think it's a complicated color um, and it is often a conversation point. Um, and if you look at sort of the gallery shots of the exhibition, there's, there's a lot of pink and I, I'm proud of that actually. Um, so I thank you for, I, that's not something I thought of up as a conversation point, but thank you for for entering that in the conversation. Hmm. Anybody want to, anybody else want to talk about pink? I can, <laughs> I guess. Thank you. Um, I would kind of admit too that uh, in a lot of my three-dimensional work, I did shy away from pink. And uh, once I started kind of returning to the two-dimensional format, 
it started popping up in a lot of stuff, like kind of subconsciously. And I found myself really starting to embrace it again. And I think for those reasons, like it felt like it was something that I should be avoiding. And I don't know if that was because I am a woman artist or just because I had liked it so much as a child. And, you know, now I'm an adult and it's like, do I, you know, do I need to grow up in my color choices? But um, I've really started to embrace it again. And I think it's a, I don't know, it really is a color that's appropriate, I think, for making artwork. I don't know, you know, that it should be kind of ignored at this point. So, and I think some of the, I don't know if the pandemic had something to do with that too, just with the color choices, it feels like people were kind of, at least for me, um, the vibrancy to kind of add, you know, a spark of vibrancy or, you know, just animation to what you're taking in with everything that was going on, especially when you're, you know, you're stuck in a house and it can get pretty drab very quickly. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we're going to see a lot of, of vibrancy or art that is exuberant in some way, whether that's scale, whether that's materials, colors. I do think that people are feeling cooped up and, and also feeling angry and feeling confused. And I think that that, you know, those aren't expressing, expressing those things don't tend to lend themselves to subtlety. Um, yeah. But I'm not, I'm not really a fan of subtle art. So I, I'm looking forward to that. I like art that is very um, messy is the wrong word, but I like, I, I, I have, I guess, sort of Baroque taste in art um, and curatorial work is sometimes subjective. I mean, I think this exhibition, somebody at the opening said that it was all very tactile. And I think I, I do find things that you want to touch to be appealing. Um, and I think there's a lot of that in that exhibition of, of fabrics, of, of materials that that maybe were in our home but have been transformed by you artists in some way. Um, and even the, the traditional sort of paintings in 2D works have a, a thickness and a texture and a, a, a visual richness to them. And that's definitely um, something I find appealing. And again, I think can be comforting in, in this time where we've been sort of in our own houses, in our own heads, in our trying to process all this information coming at us from the news, the weather, the, the world. I do think that, that there's, yeah, I, I think that some of that, the art in the show expresses that. Um, Stacy, where are we on time? We're good on time. I okay. do want to make sure that Jill gets a chance to speak because oh, we haven't sorry. heard from her I, yet. I can't see. Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, actually, when you started mentioning pink, I was like, oh, that's me. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, I do ceramics and um, there are a few, I'm in the Chicago area. There are a few um, places that do, that have ceramics art centers. And um, a while ago, someone had told me, oh, at Little Street, they have this pink glaze or slip. And everyone said, oh, you can't use that because that's not um, that's not a serious color <laughs> or something. And I was just like, well, that should be a giant green light. To use <laughs> if somebody yeah. says that to you, they are lying. <laughs> yeah. And I was just like, screw that. Like that's, <laughs> I'm going to put pink on everything. But in my pieces, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, um, I feel like they look, uh, like fleshy. Like I like the pink with, um, some of the other kind of uh, lighter reds because it has sort of like a bodily uh, reference to it and also um, in a way some of these remind me of like if the inside of your body in a way if the skin wasn't there it's like muscles or um, fluids but I like the pink for me is like a reference to like flesh and form And it's just kind of, I mean, and I've always sort of been like, um, <laughs> not a contrarian, but I, I grew up as the only girl in a family with three brothers. And so being feminine or female was always sort of less than in a way, like you're like the weak person or whatever, but I feel like um, going to something like using pink is like, 
and making something that's kind of big and textural and it's like kind of in your face and like see this is strong this is um uh this is not frail and weak <laughs> I, I i something that i have been thinking about myself and i've other curators other writers is how how much we are often indoctrinated to the things that girls little girls like are somehow not as important and somehow not as serious and how we often internalize that and and the, this pink conversation is an example of that but even you know the softness there's a lot of soft work in this exhibition work that is is fabric or is touchable or is stuffed or and that you know that, that soft is somehow weak or that that um, something comforting or something playful is, is not serious. And I have, I've been actually really trying to not just think about new work that I'm seeing being made, but even going back and looking at examples from art history of artists who were not taken as seriously because they made things that were just, just, you know, in the, the they made things that were girly or, or soft or playful or childlike and that somehow those that's not as acceptable as as other things um and it's it's been a really helpful to me to sort of examine my own sort of biases against against things like pink but even sort of others even subject matters can fall into that category and i think it sometimes when we're you know we we forget to sort of look at our own sort of tastes and things and think well why do i think that or why do i um, you know, why would someone say a color is not serious? It, it doesn't make any sense when you just sort of lay it out, but I think we get faced with those, those things every day um, in the decisions we make from everything to food, to decor, to art. Um, so I love that so many of you in this group were really taking chances with, with that kind of imagery or materials or colors um, or things like that. Um, Stacey, do we have any questions from the, the, the group or, or sorry, not uh, yeah. the, the Facebook live group or the attendees? Facebook live, I don't know. We'll check with Diane on that, but I do have one submitted question that came in um, about um, locally, you know, Dubuque has a strong tradition of realist painting. Do you see, and this is for you, I think, Laura, do you see a place for realist works in contemporary art? And if so, what interests you in realist art today? I mean, I see a place for everything <laughs> in contemporary art. If somebody is making it, it's contemporary art. There's not some like contemporary art section and then things that get get left out. If a contemporary human is making this a type of work, it's contemporary art. And I think that there's a place for every type of art. Um, I try to examine art that I look at. I try to, you know, I'm looking for, I'm looking for technique. I'm looking for um, content and I'm looking for the artist's voice. And all works of art, everything that I chose for this show, I felt like I was seeing a something interesting in all of those three aspects. Now, sometimes, you know, those levels different in, in any piece of work, maybe somebody's got great content, but, um, you know, their technique isn't as, as amazing as the next, and, you know, there, there's sort of a different level of all of those, but I, I probably for me, artist's voice is the thing that draws me in first. Um, and then I sort of make my, my decisions from there. And that's at any type of curation I'm doing. Um, so when, if I see a realist, I mean, even that I, realist painting is a broad term that could mean anything. I actually think there is some realist work in this exhibition. Um, I think that how you define realist work is, is subjective, just like anything else. Thank um, you. but I, I've certainly shown realist work in my career. Um, and I think there are some artists doing great um, realistic work, doing great abstraction, doing great things that are in between um, those things. Great, I think that's all the questions that we've gotten in. Do any of you have any questions for each other or for me after this conversation? Is the photographer for hire who does the photography for these they, they did a really really great job they did. Had, don't lose them they, they, it's a really good good thing I, I do have a question for you Laura um, I'm just I'm wondering um, 
you touched on this earlier in the conversation about um, po post pandemic and um, being faced with climate change and the kind of global community that we have now. How do you see as a, as a curator? Because I um, this show is is it's not just about the artists. I mean, your hands are all over this and putting together, you know, I mean, the, the exhibition itself is, is, and the curator, you know, is an artist and that this is an art form of, you know, you're assembling, you know, you're an assemblage artist, you know, in a way. Um, so as a curator and as a, a creative person, how do, you, how do you see the art world moving forward? Um, what are your hopes and what is your vision um, now? I mean, post pandemic, how has, has your view changed and what do you, what do you, what are you hoping for? I mean, in the last, in, in the last few years, even sort of pre pandemic, but really, you know, I'd say the last, you know, go, you know, the last four or five years um, in the time of, of sort of, increasing political unease and increasing awareness of climate thing. I have definitely seen the art world, and this is regardless of what country, what region, what media you're looking at, a real shift to politicized work. And by that I don't I don't mean work that directly takes on a political issue. I mean work that is making a strong statement about who the artist is and how they see their place in society and what they see as the responsibility of, of an artist in that world. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes the resulting imagery is, I mean, all of your work is political, even if you don't think it is. Everybody's work says something about who they are and where they come from. But I see artists really leaning into that and taking, um, taking stances and also taking stances about, um, you know, what kind of institutions they show their work in. Uh, making sure they're paid if they do something in the public, you know, fighting for fair pay if they do a mural for a business or things like that. There, those are the conversations that I find myself um, having far more in the last few years, and this COVID year has just cranked that up even higher. Is um, so I think that as a curator, that means I have to be aware of those issues that our artists are interested in, aware of the. Um, the way they see themselves professionally and as members of society. Um, and I need to be responsible in my own, you know, that there's an accountability to institutions and curators that maybe wasn't there 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, I, I'm, I like it. <laughs> Not every institution and curator does. Um, I, I like that type, those types of difficult conversations and difficult work. Um, but there's, there's not a lot of people right now who are painting pretty pictures and not delving deeper into them. And it, that doesn't mean that that's not a value judgment. There's, there's always a place for that, but those are the conversations that I'm hearing no matter where I go, whether it's to the coffee shop here in Des Moines or to a gallery in New York or, you know, an artist I'm working with now um, that's, you know, happens to show internationally and live in Las Vegas. Um, so I think that, that the, that's going to be the next what the next few years look like, um, and I I want people to be up for the challenge of difficult conversations, but I know that you know it's always a pendulum. So that means you know maybe in ten years we'll all be back to talking about formal compositions and color and and things that are are more introspective. Um, so yeah, I, I that's that's the art. That's the type of conversations that I find myself in the most now and the type of art that I, I am drawn to. And I know that that's the other thing and that this is kind of a caveat is that's not for everybody. That's not what everybody wants out of an experience when they go to an art gallery or an art museum. And even the acknowledgement of that, that's okay too. Like that's a conversation that I think, you know, I think a lot of museums and people who go to museums, they feel the pressure to like walk in and, and love and appreciate everything they see being more open about the fact that, you know, when you walk into a show, maybe not all the art is for you and that's okay. Like even that conversation is one I've had more in the last <laughs> few years than, than in other years. So um, I, I think that sort of, you know, finding curators and museums and galleries are finding their place in the world in the same way that artists are and seeing how that, you know, ties into the big picture, not being siloed away.
Great. Thank you for that, Laura. That's a, that was a great answer. Maybe a, a good way to end our conversation today. So thank you, Laura. Thank you, all thank of our artists. All. Thank you, yeah. Laura. Thank, thank you, Stacy. Thank, thank you. So, so. This has been right. great. Great, great. And reminder for everyone that the um, biennial is open until October 31st. And you can always visit the exhibition online at dbqart.org, where you can find information about all of the artists in the exhibition. And you can listen to some audio guides by many of the artists. Thank you for tuning in and goodbye for now.